स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Nareesh Mehipal, Senior Assistant Professor from Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. This is my tenth and uh, last lecture on uh, insurance law. Title of this lecture is Perils of the Sea. Before I discuss with you Perils of the Sea, I wish to inform. that previously we have discussed almost all the concepts principles of insurance law maybe it is life insurance property insurance or marine insurance in the very beginning we have discussed about the nature and concept of insurance law thereafter we discussed about the historical development of insurance globally as well as in indian context how it originated and uh, growth thereafter we have discussed various acts also like uh, lic and insurance ombudsman scheme and many more things thereafter we discussed about the principles of insurance those principles which are very significant in formation of any contract if i say any contract it means any contract which is governed by indian contract act maybe it is your life insurance contract maybe it is marine maybe it is general insurance contract and discussing those principles informed us that what helps the underwriters to frame a policy on the basis of those principles thereafter we discussed about the concept of life insurance and thereafter we also discussed about the premium that what is premium in any of the policy how it is calculated how it is determined on the basis of what factors what are variables a, a insurance policy is made out and how they keep the premium amount for any person then we discussed about the insurable risks what risks are insured and what insure risks are not insured by the insurers and then we discussed about the concept of marine insurance what is marine insurance its historical development origin of the marine insurance and thereafter those principles which helps to formulate a marine policy and various other more things in today's lecture we will discuss about the perils of the sea while discussing the perils of the sea introducing that that what is perils of sea we will also discuss about the essentials of a marine insurance contract that what are the essentials to form a marine insurance contract thereafter we will also discuss about the claim procedure in marine insurance that if one wants to claim in marine insurance what is the procedure to be followed at that then we will also discuss how the compensation is calculated what are the factors which are responsible for calculating the compensation amount then lastly we will discuss on the very new topic that is your marine pollution which is very less discussed but very important these days so let us start with this very first topic that is about the perils of the sea 
perils of the sea is one of the most important concept of marine insurance as every marine insurance policy mandatorily includes loss due to perils of the sea but at the same time it is one of the most difficult concept to define and understand even though some principles have been evolved for determining whether a particular incident is caused by a peril of sea or not it is impossible to come out with a common solution for all there are different notions regarding this term worldwide but in a comprehensive way it is covering almost everything that happens on voyage in insurance law the peril insured against may be any peril which the assured seeks and the insurers are willing to give protection in seton versus bernard lord halsbury made a remark that of course the transaction itself of guaranteeing the solvency of somebody who is to a security for somebody else debt is i admit a somewhat extraordinary transaction i was not aware until this case that such transaction as this any more than the determination of judicial tribunals is now made the subject of policy at lloyds so this is very important remark which was made by the lord halsbury in seton versus bernard in the year 1900 the forementioned remark signifies that any risk that the parties to an insurance contract agree upon may be covered the occurrence of a hazard covered by the policy shall give rise to an indemnification right for the assured provided that the loss is attributable only to that peril and not to any other perils the portion of marine insurance that is comparatively most crucial is risk or peril the term insured perils refers to a fundamental problem in marine insurance whereby the insurer undertakes to compensate the assured for any loss resulting from maritime perils that endanger the affirmed assets or profits in actuality the parties agreement determines the scope of the covered risk by choosing the proper set of institute clauses in marine insurance there may be two broad categories of the insured perils on hull and cargo policies number 1 marine risks and secondly war and strike risks securing the assured's interest and providing indemnification for any loss or damage that uh, may arise on the insured subject during a marine adventure constitute the fundamental purpose of marine insurance expressly covered under the former sg form applying to both 
ships and products dangers of the sea are now expressly insured under the hull clauses 95 which provide coverage for loss or damage experienced by the insured subject matter caused by perils of the sea rivers lakes or other navigable waters at present there is no statutory definition for perils of the sea under the english law the marine insurers act 1906 defines only maritime perils and states that the term perils of the sea as used in a marine insurance policy does not include every casualty which may happen to the subject matter of the insurance on sea it must be a peril of or due to the sea there is difference between perils of the sea and perils on the sea what is insured is perils of the sea the term perils of the sea refers only to fortuitous accidents or casualties of the sea it does not include the ordinary actions of winds and waves coming to indian context the law relating to marine insurance is incorporated in the marine insurance act 1963 this act is more or less similar to the english act of 1906 like the english act this act does not define the perils of the sea it only defines maritime perils section 2e of the act defines maritime perils as perils consequent on or incidental to the navigation of the sea that is to say perils of the sea fire war perils pirates rovers thieves captures seizures restraints and detainments of princes and peoples jettisons barratry and other perils which are likely of the like kind or may be designated by the policy these are to be termed as maritime perils perils of the sea refers to extraordinary forces of nature that maritime ventures might encounter in the course of voyage the term perils of the sea used in marine policy do not include every casualty which may occur to the subject matter of the insurance on the sea it means perils of the sea includes those accidents or casualties which do not happen due to the free will of a human being some examples of these perils include stranding sinking collision heavy wave action and high winds etc so these are certain examples which are included into the perils of the sea the term peril of the sea refers broadly speaking to everything 
that is caused by divine intervention that occurs to a ship when it is in a sea. In summary, the term perils of the sea refers to anything that happens to a vessel while it is at sea as a result of an act of God and not human interference or human activity. Furthermore, losses of commodities that are on board resulting from an irresistible force, a natural disaster or an overpowering power that exceeds human ability and caution are covered by the term perils of the sea in marine insurance. It solely comprises the losses resulting from the elements violent impact as opposed to the elements quite steady action upon the vessel itself. As a result, the insurer will only be responsible if the loss or damage is directly caused by a sea related accident such as storm, cyclone, wave, etc. Marine perils means the perils consequent on or incidental to the navigation of the sea. That is to say, perils of the sea, fire, war perils, that is the enemies, pirates, rovers, thieves, captures, restraints, seizures, and detainment of prince and peoples, jettisons, barratry, and other perils either of the like kind or which may be designated by the policy. This is how we define maritime perils. So, there is a problem in defining perils of the sea because it is not a part of the Indian law or the English law. So, with the help of certain cases and through various notes in the subsequent years as the marine insurance grew the term of the peril of the sea is determined. That is to say, it is evident from many court decisions that have addressed the meaning and use of the phrase perils of the sea, that it is more nuanced and complex than it first appears. The courts have made sporadic and sometimes unsuccessful attempts to differentiate between the perils of the sea and other dangers such as unseaworthiness, carelessness, normal wear and tear, barratry, willful behavior etc. So, these are very different from the perils of the sea perils of the sea is basically when it is termed to be an act of God, when it is unforeseen and when every caution has been taken during the voyage. It is not about the careless attitude of any person. Different situations require different questions to be asked and distinctions to be made. For example, Sea water may be purposefully introduced into a ship with or without the ship owner's knowledge. Ship owner has no knowledge that water has been entered into the ship. It may also occur from crew negligence such as leaving a valve or port open when it should have been closed, the water enters into the ship and occasionally because of the ship's inherent unsuitability due to the normal wear and tear, latent defects or even 
unseaworthiness. We cannot thereafter dispute the fact that not all accidents or casualties occurring at sea can be generalized as perils of the sea. Carelessness and everything that cannot be a peril of the sea. The requirement of incidental to the navigation of the ship has been proven in light of the above authorities as vital in clarifying a sea peril. What falls under the criteria perils of the sea is still not fully answered even though rule 7 of the rules of construction restricts the term to only fortuitous accidents and casualties exclusive of the ordinary winds and waves. A more comprehensive definition however may be found in the judgment of Lord Bremwell in Thames and Mercy Insurance Company versus Hamilton, Fraser and Company 1887 that reads as every accidental circumstances not the result of ordinary wear and tear, delay or of the act of assured happening in the course of navigation of the ship and incidental to the navigation and causing loss to the subject matter of the insurance. So, every act during the navigation of the ship is not included within the perils of the sea. He also proved the definition of Justice Lobbs in Hamilton, Fraser and Company versus Pandroff and Company that in a seaworthy ship, damage to goods caused by the action of the sea during transit not attributable to the fault of anybody is a damage from a peril of the sea. In another case, CCR Fishing Limited versus Tomenson 1991, the Supreme Court of Canada attempted to define the term by laying down two elements which are necessary to form a peril of the sea that is fortuity and of the seas. From this discussion we can say that only events that are fully unexpected and taken place at sea are eligible as perils of the sea. Even prior to the codification of the Marine Insurance Act 1906, Lord McEnton in Thames and Mercy Marine Insurance Company versus Hamilton, Fraser and Company 1887 had already proclaimed that it was impossible to actually frame the definition of the words perils of the sea. The inexhaustive extent of the perils make the terms as even more difficult to define. The big question remains unsolved. What is considered accident? fortuitous and expected in order to hold a particular loss as one occasioned by perils of the sea. If it is caused by accident, then what is an accident? After reviewing the meaning of the term perils of the sea, there is a fact that the meaning of the term has yet to be fully established. So, it is difficult to define perils of the sea in exact terms. Now let us see what are the elements of the perils of the sea. After getting the meanings of the peril of sea, let us discuss the elements of the perils of the sea. From a clear perspective of the meaning of 
perils of the sea, it is best to look into the words that have been frequently used when perils of the sea are mentioned that is fortuitous and accidental. These two words will make more clear that what are the perils of the sea. So, let us discuss these two words one by one and these two words are the elements of the perils of the sea. The first is fortuitous that is the futurist you can say whatever is happening in the future. According to Cambridge International Dictionary of English, fortuitous means something that is not planned or a happening by chance. A fortuity is something that is unintentional and inevitable which we cannot evade. A fortuitous loss must not be one that caused intentionally and also not a result of inevitable deterioration generated by the ordinary action of the winds and the waves. So, the important thing is that when we discuss about the future events, it means the something which is happening that is not planned or it is happening by chance and that too not carelessly and it happened inevitably. Nothing can stop from happening that action at that time that may amount to perils of the sea. Lord Wright by referring to the storms at sea that is indeed outside the ordinary winds and waves opined in Canada Rice Mills versus Union Marine and General Insurance in the year 1941 in the following words. They may happen on the voyage, but it cannot be said that it must happen. Perils may happen or may not, that is unforeseen, it is inevitable, but with due care has been taken for that. In their lordship's judgment, it cannot be predicted that where damage is caused by a storm, even though its incidence or force is not exceptional, a finding of loss of perils of the sea may not be justified. Although the precise timing of these incidents cannot be predicted, such as storm waves. They are nevertheless foreseeable events. If any of these incidents occur during the cruise or the navigation of the sea, the damage resulting from them cannot be conclusively stated to have been anticipated, absolving the responsibility of insurer. This cannot be done because we cannot foresee that what will happen in the future during the navigation. A simple incursion of sea water would not immediately point to perils of the sea unless it can be shown that the event was fortuitous and in order to do so, some evidence pointing to the adverse and unusual condition occurrence. A fortuitous event taking place from within the vessel during the voyage that makes her unseaworthy and allows water into her. The loss resulted from it is peril of the sea even though the action of the sea is rendered inevitable 
by the occurrence and weather. At and near the time of the loss was perfectly fine. So, after understanding the fractures, now we will discuss about the accidental element. Accidental or casualty as it is sometime called is defined as something that happens unexpectedly and unintentionally which specially caused damage or injury. Again, for the purpose of understanding this element of a sea peril, the judgment of Lord Sumner in Samuel versus Dumas 1924 can be looked into where he said that accidents are not what is ordinary? What will happen more or less in any case is not fortuitous. To say that if you make a hole under water, water will ordinarily come in is only a guide. That is an extraordinary manner of water to enter a hole at sea. To say that Scuttling is not a peril of the sea because it has nothing to do with the seas except there are the scenes on which the drama of crime is played out appears to me also to be playing with words. In order to ascertain what sort of perils falls under this most commonly covered range of risk in marine insurance, the conclusive meaning of the term is deemed pertinent. In defining perils of the sea and ascertaining whether a particular peril qualify as such, it is extremely important to always bear in mind the two conditions proposed by Iwami above, firstly that such peril must be accidental and fortuitous and secondly that it must be of the sea, not peril in the sea but peril of the sea. Now after discussing the perils of the sea, let us discuss what are the perils of the sea which are specifically insured by the insurer's company. Perils of the sea which are insured are number one sinking of the sea, one cannot predict where and under what circumstances the sink, the sea will sink. Secondly, damage to the ship and cargo due to the dashing of the waves. Third peril of the sea which can be insured is dashing of the ship on the rocks or big stones, fire or explosion on the ship. Other peril which can be insured is spoilage of cargo due to sea water, due to high waves, due to high tides. If the cargo, the things got destroyed on the sea, in that situation it can be insured. Another one is destruction of the ship and cargo by the crew or captain of the ship piracy and other such risks and do not include the ordinary actions of winds and waves. Let us discuss all these insured elements one by one. The very first one is 
perils of the sea. The inherent risk of the cargo is excluded under the seas hazards, normal wind and wave activity and normal vessel wear and tear. The underwriter is not always liable for risk on the sea, but he may be responsible for damages brought on by maritime hazards. The term perils of the sea describes unfortunate incidents or maritime deaths. Assume that the assured's deliberate misbehavior or deceit is the cause of any loss resulting from one of the sea's guaranteed dangers. The underwriter is then released from any liability under the terms of the policy. Thus, if a ship hits a sunken rock and sinks or collides with another ship and suffers a loss, it is a case of loss by perils of the sea. It is an unforeseen event. You cannot see the sinken that rock and then your ship collided with another ship in that situation. Other examples of such loss are number one, loss of cargo as a result of seawater entering the ship through a hole made by rats in the bottom of the ship. Another example is loss resulting from negligent navigation provided it was caused by the peril of a sea. Another example is loss by perils of the sea is that loss of cargo due to heat produced by the closing of ventilators to prevent the entry of sea water on rough weather. Again, it will be termed to be a peril of sea. The second element of the perils of sea is fire. In olden times, fire was the biggest maritime peril, but recently it has been under control to a greater extent. Damage resulting from fire and smoke is included under fire peril. The water used for extinguishing a fire incident may cause damage to the insured goods. So, this peril is also insurable. The damage due to spontaneous combustion may be maritime peril and be insured against. Damage was done if due to the lightning, explosion and fire originating from the negligence of the crew are recoverable from underwriters. The losses which are not included in the standard policy can be covered by having special clauses and paying an extra premium. So, we can say that fire is one of the most common perils of the sea and the underwriter is liable to loss caused by it. Though every type of fire is not covered by the policy, damage caused by smoke or by the heat of fire or damage by water used to put out or prevent the spread of fire or fire 
resulting from lightning spontaneous combustion explosion negligence of the master or crew etc are covered by the policy if the loss is caused by willful misconduct of the insured or the fire takes place on account of the inherent vice or nature of the subject matter insured the insurer is not responsible so if the insured acts negligently and the fire takes place in that situation the insurer is not responsible for that third element is man of war what it means it says that this is the vessel that is authorized by nations for the purpose of defense or attack in the event of hostilities and in damage to the goods or ships arising out of collision against a man of war is insurable enemies next element says that enemies literally means one who tries or wishes to harm or attack or one who has ill feeling or hatred towards another that is the meaning of enemies tile ships belonging to the foe that is enemy may cause loss to the insured and is re underwritten by the marine policy this policy extends to all the persons of the enemy country and to their hostile acts provided such acts form part of the enemy's action next element is pirates rovers thieves while there was still occasional dangers from rovers pirates and thieves nowadays they had significantly decreased due to more vigilance new technology it has been significantly decreased people who are not within a state's authority typically carry out these crimes in an effort to further their own interests the term thieves does not refer to any crew members officers or passengers that steal covertly or without authorization so now there is a differentiation between thieves also if any officer any passenger commits theft in the ship itself it will not be termed to be a peril of the sea but if pirates robbers do so in that situation it will be a peril of c in the olden days when means of communications and transport were not so developed the perils on accounts of pirates that means to say sea robbers but it includes the passengers of ship who rise in revolt or those who attack the ship from the shore rovers to be known as wanderers and pirates on the high seas they keep moving from one place to another place in the sea and thieves those robbers using force for violence and not clandestine thieves or pilferers or pickpockets from among the passenger or crew were very common so during the old time when the transport medium communication was not so developed at that time pirates and rovers and thieves were very common at that time the acts by those persons are committed for the pursuit of private ends by robbery or marauders plundering indiscriminately in places beyond the jurisdiction of a state in the modern time however these cases are rare because now the territories have the jurisdiction so pirates can be seen at a very few place or no place at that time 
another element is jettison jettison is the voluntary discarding of cargo or a portion of vessel's equipment to prevent lightning strikes or to free the ship for everybody's safety the purpose of purposefully discarding the cargo when the cargo is discarded to save the cargoes and the life of the persons or property is removed the vessel from an impeding danger that is called as jettison also that items falls by mistake do not automatically become jettisoned it is not by mistake it is intentionally removed the ship has been sunk or due to the care everything has been removed from the ship and it is allowed to be discarded but those items which fall by mistake in the sea are not to be termed as jettison additional the jettison does not contain on inherent vice of cargo in other words jettisoning is the voluntary and intentional throwing overboard or away a part of cargo or part of vessel's equipment for the purpose of lightening to free up the space or relieving the ship in case of necessity or emergency to have a safe adventure or voyage that is called jettison the ship is kept empty it is lightened things are thrown in the sea intentionally to protect the life to protect the articles that is called jettison and it is covered under the perils of the sea as well if the cargo or any other thing is thrown overboard accidentally or fortuitously then it does not constitute jettison it should however be remembered that no jettison of cargo owing to its inherent voice is covered by the policy another element is barratry barratry is any wrong doing on the part of the master or crew that is done knowingly to the owner's detriment barracking needs to be done covertly without the owner's knowledge examples of barratry include theft which is followed by putting a ship on fire and fraudulent vessel and cargo sales that occur without the ship owner's knowledge or consent if barratry is insured the insurer is responsible for any losses resulting from barratry justice scruton defines barratry as any willful act or wrong doing by the master against ship and goods even though with the intention of benefiting ship owner barratry of marines include fraud or crime causing loss or damage to goods committed under circumstances that would not be prevented with the ship owner negligence even amounting to recklessness or carelessness will not consist barratry there must be an intention to injure vessel or goods that is called barratry eighth element is restraints and detainments restraints are measures taken by the national government to prevent unrestricted usage of a port it can result in cargo sacrifice trip disruption and perhaps the loss of such ports the term 
detainments refers to losses that arise from a vessel and its cargo being held captive while in the port due to obstructions quarantine laws or other interventions by a country's law enforcement authorities it does not cover losses resulting from a simple travel delay or stoppage a loss of market or any other distant consequences ninth element is the free of capture and seizure clause that is known as fc and s clause war risks are often covered by the policy however the free of capture and seizure clause often known as the war clause is introduced to ease war hazards including the dangers of an unexpected declaration of war if this clause is removed the policy automatically reverts to its initial state and appropriate premiums are accessed tenth element is explosion the risk of the explosion has greatly increased the explosion on board a vessel damaging hull or cargo or both could be construed as perils on the sea and an explosion on shore might damage a ship or its cargo marine cargo policies were amended to include the risk of explosions not clearly caused by war perils in case of hull policies the explosion on shipboard or elsewhere is covered in the amended inch mary or negligence clause the 11th element is strikes riots and civil commutation clause the marine insurance on cargo is extended to cover from warehouse to warehouse or otherwise ensures the goods on shores prior to shipments and after discharge the danger of underwriters being held liable for losses resulting from the unlawful acts of strikers from riots or civil commutations in materially enhanced 12th element is all other perils it provides that sea hazards include things like animals dying from a lack of feed after a long voyage worms eating through woods and losses caused by the sea's salt water heat perspiration and oil damage are possibly additional damages that fall under other perils insurance furthermore it is also established that not all ship related casualties or accidents at sea may be easily classified as maritime perils the event that results in the loss must occur during and incidental to navigation in order for it to be classified as a sea perils now what are those excluded losses that are not regarded as perils of the sea normal wear and tear springing a leak breakage of goods inherent vice proximate cause and so these are the excluded clauses so what are the essentials of a marriage insurance contract section 25 of the indian marine insurance act specify the essential matters that should be a part of marine policy name of the insured or that of the person on his behalf voyage or time period the subject matter 
and the risk against which it is insured, name of the insurers, amount or the sum insured. Marine insurance policies are complex contracts that provide protection to the insured party against various risks such as the key essentials of marine insurance policies are as following. Number one is declaration. Secondly, covered risks. And thirdly, policy limits. Premium is also that amount which is paid by insured party in exchange for coverage under the marine insurance policy. Fifth one is voyage or transit details. Sixth is valuation and sum insured. The policy will specify how the insured value of the subject matter is determined. Seventh is deductibles. And eighth is exclusions. Ninth claims procedures. And tenth one is subrogation. Eleventh is about the termination and cancellation. So, these are the key essentials of a marine policy. Now, what is the claim procedure in marine insurance? Claim process involves notification, survey of the ship or the cargo, documentation, settlement of the claims and how the compensation can be calculated. Some common methods are actual cash value. This method calculates the compensation based on the market value of the insured property. Second is aggregate value and third one is new for old. This method provides full compensation for the insured property. In addition to above, there are other legislations which are applicable in India in relation to maritime law such as carriage of goods by sea, bills of lading act, merchant shipping act, multimodal transportation of goods act. The last topic that is very important is to discuss about the marine pollution. It is a growing problem in today's world. Our ocean is being flooded with two main types of pollution that is chemicals and trash. Chemical contamination, nutrient pollution, po pollution is concerning health, environment and economic reasons. The increased concentration of chemicals such as nitrogen and phosphorus promotes the growth of illegal blooms which can be toxic to wildlife. Marine trash encompasses all manufactured products, most of them plastic that end up in the ocean. So, we have to be very sensitive about the solutions for marine pollution that includes prevention and cleanup. So, to conclude our this topic, we have discussed about the perils of the sea, essentials of a marine insurance contract, how the claim process is determined in marine insurance and how the compensation is calculated and lastly what are the types of marine pollution and how we can go through the what steps we can take to eliminate the marine pollution. I hope that the perils of the sea is very much clearly uh, understood by you. A very thank you to all of you for listening this lecture perils on the sea.